so I figured I'd ask just sort of a general question for everybody, just sort of get a feel for, um, you know, where everyone's at. So I was curious if you, if you guys could go back in time and work on the design um, or production of any film or TV show, uh, what would it be and why? And I guess we can just go down the, go down the row since it's more of a general question. Yeah, so why don't we start with Andrew? Yeah, so any movie or TV show? I mean, it's a tricky one. I think the movie that visually struck me the most um, as a kid growing up and, and that kind of like inspired me to get into animation um, was the original Blade Runner. I mean, th that movie just blew my small, you know, mind away when I saw it and and just like the composition of every frame and just how they turn things on its head and the camera moves and just the use of miniatures and um, I know uh, how how amazing that concept art is so like to go back in time to work on the concept art for Blade Runner would be amazing I mean like I'm a massive sci-fi nerd yeah so that would be that would be the one in short that's a good choice yeah awesome let's go what about you Laura Oh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily do over like the films, but to just be a part of the production, uh, <laughs> cause it's like, oh, the things that I love, it's like, oh, I love them the way they are. So I wouldn't want them to change, but just yeah. to be included in a magic would have been really cool. Um, I think being part of the costume department for Star Wars Episode One, The Phantom Menace would have been incredible um, because I think that they really took the aesthetics of that universe, like they really uh, created this antiquated but like universal sense of like textiles and silhouettes and design for particularly uh, uh, Queen Amidala, and then oh, even yeah. seeing how some of the other politicians in the universe, like how their costumes compared to the original trilogy. I think it was uh, really fabulous. Uh, Trisha Bigar was the costume designer on that. And yeah. just like, what a yummy movie to look at for the costumes. <laughs> so much fun to like, you know, to see that and the incredible amount of research she had to do and all the cultures like that she was kind of, you know, like mixing to you know, portray this otherworldly galaxy. I think that would have been incredible to be a part of and would have satisfied my little nerdy Star Wars heart. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Let's go to Roman. Sure. Uh, that, that's such a hard question because I think the films and television shows we love the most were probably done the best. Uh, <laughs> so to, to go back and change them it's just such a difficult thing but I think what Laura was saying is absolutely right that just being a part of something that you love so much would actually be the true honor there mm -hmm. um, I don't know I guess I was thinking lately about interstellar just because of where we are with our planet and uh, you know the coronavirus and I think any movie where uh, I find myself you know, on the brink of tears towards the end of it is the kind of movie I'd want to be exploring right now, especially as a composer to uh, impart some of my own emotions and um, human experience on something that's uh, so far reaching emotionally would really be, um, you know, I guess the most rewarding. Yeah. Awesome. Let's go to Steve. Uh, I think if I was gonna, I mean, yeah, like everyone's saying, uh, I'm thinking about the best things ever. Like if I'm a game composer, so of course, like there's Mario and Zelda and Metroid, but at the same time, I, I would not want to touch those IPs uh, <laughs> in any sense of the, of the of my imagination. I don't think I can make that any better. But um, but recently, I'm really into Twin Peaks, and oh. just, you know that's sort of you know not early '90s. Angelo Badalamenti, or I've never said his name out loud, I don't know how he's, you know. <laughs> but uh, he's got a thing, right? Um, and I'm completely jealous of the fact that he got to work with David Lynch, um, both from like a, you know, because David Lynch did a lot of, does a lot of sound design as well. Um, so that like partnership, I'm like very jealous. I would love to just wreak as, or like take as much as I can off of uh you know but a potential collaboration with david lynch i think i would learn a lot from him i, just, I love his creativity 
and I love how he uses audio, both music and sound design, to tell his story. Mm-hmm. Um, there's like lots of little subtle. I'm, this is my I'm on my second watch through now. I'm like I've never picked up some of these things uh, that he's telling, like the storytelling he's doing through sound design. Um, but as a composer, like I love Angelo's take on the soundtrack, and I I would love to, you know, put my spin on uh, sort of like both the diegetic and the non-diegetic music that's sort of mm-hmm. in the the Twin Peaks world. Nice. And let's finish off with Leo. Looks like Leo's muted. Sorry about that. Just unmuted. <laughs> yeah, I, you, you took my muting power away from me. I wasn't allowed to, to do it. Um, yeah, I, I have a specific answer to this question that I have thought about a bit. It's not even one of my favorite movies, but it just like hits a setting I like a lot. Uh, I, I would love to rescore Apollo 13. I've just like always wanted to do that. There is something, um, I, I am a huge fan of like the American Western as a genre. And I think it taps into actually a lot of stuff that is like applicable in 2020 in terms of like wanting to just like the freedom of a wide open space, which like none of us can find right now. And a, you know, sort of what was said about Interstellar, like it's very timely, this thought of kind of like expanding outward, going into the stars and like, well, while we haven't probably adequately explored everything on earth as well as we should have, like space is kind of that Western genre for 2020. And I, I don't know that, I just think that movie is like the perfect blend of like cheesy Americana, rah, rah, mixed with like, some of those bigger questions about like where we sit in the like universe and also just like you know humans working together to like save other humans like i don't know it, it's uh it, it nails them all for me yeah and like the score is great but but it's like not i wouldn't say it's like an untouchable favorite of mine so like yeah mm-hmm. i'll give that a, i'll give that a go <laughs> all right okay Great question, Andy. I'm going to mute you now. <laughs> and then uh, next we have a question from Vic. Hey guys, Vic from Drop Spotlight. A question for everybody. Um, I know you guys pour your heart and souls into your projects. Uh, what is a good estimation of time per day do you guys put into each individual project? All right, and um, we can start with Andrew. There we go, hey guys, I'm back. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so, so that's a tricky one. I mean, so, with animation, it just it depends on the scale of the project. You know, at, at any given time, I can be working really intensely, um, like I am at the moment, on uh, uh, two projects. But I'll always be like, I'll always be overseeing as like a studio creative director. I'll always be overseeing all the smaller projects that are coming in and out of the studio. And I think that's actually something that I still battle with on the daily. Is that our industry is so unpredictable, and each brief is so different and requires such a different skill set and you know our our studio is like you know a medium-sized studio and uh, we don't have um, a skill set for every small little little kind of um, uh, skill set that we'd maybe need for a deliverable so we generally depending on what the vision is for the project we'll build a team around it you know um, which has its own set of kind of um, uh, limitations which are really exciting sometimes so um, you know on uh, we did an international project recently for example and uh, we scaled up just for that project to a team of 25 artists and 13 of those artists were living uh, in seven different time zones so we had to like manage our time (laughs) around feedback and and then your day is literally not your usual we work from nine to six but you end up that that day starts stretching itself out and becoming like a nine to 10, 11, um, because, you know, you'll be supplying feedback for people that literally cannot continue with their part of the job until they've received feedback. And there's a time delay and they're just waking up and they've got to have the feedback to continue that day. So it's tricky, man. I mean, um, I think, yeah, animation is just one of those 
those weird industries where the hours seem just stretched out a bit, especially because of rendering time and things like that. And you need to QC uh, your renders once they're done. And sometimes you've forgotten and you've got the wrong render camera and just, oh my God, you spend all these hours and then you just got to quickly like kind of uh, start from scratch again. Um, so I don't really have a definitive answer for you. I think I try and fit as much in, in a regular nine to six as possible, but the spillover, I mean, right now it's uh, just after 9 PM. So things like this, I mean, this is work, you know, so things spill over into the evenings. Uh, we're doing more and more work with the US and, uh, and, and LA, and that's a nine hour time difference. So yeah, things kind of spill over and uh, days just become longer is essentially my answer, I think, to you. Awesome, and we're gonna go over to Laura. Uh, I was just like, wow, that's amazing when you're dealing with other countries like that adds a whole other, you know, um, uh, complication in terms of scheduling and <laughs> just in all of that I haven't had that pleasure yet <laughs> um, I uh, if I'm in production usually it's an all-day affair so from the moment I wake up literally probably the moment I go to bed if I'm working on a film because um, you know preparatory periods on a film can be anywhere from a few weeks to a couple of months and um, Usually the the projects I've had the pleasure of designing, I've been on the shorter end. So uh, prep will then extend into when we start shooting. So, you know, you start planning, you know, prioritizing what the needs are for the film, what's going to be coming up first. But because of that, you know, it's even though, you know, you may be on a 12 hour a day, you know, contract you're well working into 18 19 hours just because you know you're trying to communicate with different people you know if you're working with certain actors or actresses their teams may not be back to you like get back to you regarding sizes or measurements and then they play the next day and they're flying in from another state and you're like oh, i need to make sure i have clothes for them so they don't show up to set naked unless that's the needs of the show <laughs> but um yeah you know it can be very daunting and work into the weekends very easily so um, when I'm on a production I usually consider myself really unavailable 24 7 because any few time like little bit of time I have which may be an hour before bed really is like decompressing time to take everything in and just be able to catch up with you know family or my husband or something like that but otherwise it's like non-stop work so um but yeah, very long hours, but obviously do it because you're very, you know, I'm very passionate about what I do, so. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll go off to Roman. I, I guess the short answer would be uh, you spend all day, every day doing it. <laughs> most projects, um, I think, probably speak for most of the people who are doing post, uh, or at least in the music, I tend to be the last, uh, one of the last stops um so it's kind of like if you don't get it done now in a timely manner you're going to hold up the whole production um so <laughs> there's a lot of pressure on that to work quickly and then that means that you're spending all day doing it um and i think you know i was lucky i came my background was i started doing commercials first uh, and that's the same kind of thing where you're replacing music that they've already temped out and it's they need it yesterday kind of thing um, and then when you get into films and television, the deadlines, uh, I'd say are, are similar for the most part. Um, the feature stuff I've done has been a little bit more lax uh, compared to the television stuff, which is again, like we need it yesterday. Um, and so it's kind of heavy to balance that stuff. Um, but it's, it's what Laura was saying and Andrew, I mean, we're just working all the time. This is, these are passion uh, projects that we're getting paid to do. I mean, you're doing it because your heart's in it, but you're also working as hard because there's a whole team relying on you. Um, so it feel, <laughs> this is gonna feel weird to say, but it feels weird when you're not working uh, because you get so used to helping other people um, that at a certain point, it, I would say it's not actually working anymore. It's just being part of the creative machine with everybody else. Awesome. Great, and we'll go to Steve, then Leo. Uh, so I'm, you know, as, as someone in the game industry, I'm used to like crunch hours and kind of like insane 60 hour work weeks plus uh, working over weekends. Um, and when I left my day job doing that a couple of years back, I just sort of made the decision that I wouldn't ever live that way again. Um, it was draining and I, 
even when I was trying to sleep, couldn't sleep. And I barely saw my family. I have kids, you know, so, so I like really when I, when I left that world, I was like, oh, I'm just going to do the regular nine to five, nine to six thing and save my extra hours for like creative original music projects, like bands that I'm in. And, you know, I live in Nashville and a lot of my like lifelong music friends live here and I, I want to collaborate with them. So a little selfish kind of projects, you know what I mean? That are outside of uh, work for money. Uh, not that, I mean, like, like uh, Roman, like you were saying, like uh, projects that I am spending my day doing, I believe in. And I think that that's a luxury as a musician, as a composer, to only be able to take those kinds of projects that not only like are creatively fulfilling or have like a vision that you believe in artistically, uh, but also for me technically, like if I want to get better at a technical skill, like I'm doing a huge AI music generative project right now that I'm just like super psyched about. Um, it's not original music or, and it's like, oh, it's trying to be art, but it's fulfilling, you know, it's like, so the fact that we get to make those kinds of decisions is a luxury. Um, but uh, yeah, I try, I definitely try to spend my nights and weekends with my family. It's so hard, even like the, you know, I try to do that and I fail. Um, but just, you know, from, from a game industry perspective, oh, by the way, like to all you people that work in TV, I feel you, like um, I did that for like two years where I worked, I did those projects, like that, that was what all I did for those two years. And it was, uh, you know, very, very draining and creatively fulfilling nonetheless. Um, and this is some of my favorite projects that I've, I've been able to do, but, um, you know, uh, kind of like stepped away from that intentionally. I'm just like, oh, I can't, like game industry is crazy too. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, at least like being able to set my own schedule and take the work that I want to take, uh, you know, I, it's, it's a little bit more in my wheelhouse and I can sort of manage that kind of schedule a little bit more. Sorry, it's a long winded answer. I hope that's, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, it's all good. It's all good, man. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Let's go on to Leo. Hello. Uh, I, I feel like everyone hit a lot of my answers there. Like the schedule is grueling, but rewarding. I very frequently will work like 16 hours in a day. Uh, one thing I, I'll, I'll die, I'll go into like a slight tangent just about how I like schedule things out. I started this like new experiment a couple months ago where I just get up like absurdly early and try to do all of my like deep work before anybody has a chance to email me. Um, so like I pop out of bed like before 5 a.m. and I'm like in the chair drinking coffee. It's dark everywhere. So there's like nothing to do except just like stare at my computer and my keyboard and like do like all the intense creative work. And then by the time like 9 a.m. rolls around, in theory, I've gotten four hours of really, really exhausting work done. Take a break, make some breakfast, go walk the dog. And then... Uh, you know, deal with the day-to-day -day operations as like the needs come in. Um, another thing that like, I don't always have control over, but I try to like keep going is like to have two sort of projects that are radically different kind of happening at the same time. So like, if I need to refresh my brain, I can sort of work back and forth between them. And like, I don't really have control over what gets offered to me all the time. And, and especially what the calendars are, because like, Generally, I'm sure everyone will agree when, when you get hired for something like they usually just lie to you about what the schedule is. And then, and then it changes like four times and then everything is on top of each other. But uh, that way, you know, if I spend all day Monday, like really working on one thing that's like, you know, big, dense orchestra, I can like on the next day work on something totally different that is like dark ambient synths and like get, get, get a little like refresh happening. Um, you know, when the schedule allows. Sweet, thank you. Great, thanks for the question, Vic. And then next we have um, Steven. So let me go ahead and unmute you. Hi, if you can't tell, um, my question's for Leo about Cobra Kai. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, first off, um, you, you and your composer, Zach Robinson, were rock stars for a night. You both performed the music of Cobra Kai live at the Whiskey A Go Go. I think it was back in June 2019. I was oh, there. Oh, yeah. I loved every second. You were there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Uh, can you talk about putting that together? I w um, it was amazing. I mean, you played 
you know, first season one and two, and even had surprise guests. Uh, I think William, you know, Johnny Lawrence himself came out. Yeah, yeah. Car. You ended with the cover of You're the Best, you know, with Joe. Um, how did it feel that night? I mean, that was amazing. Oh, I mean, that's like the most fun I've had in, in years. Um, and we actually did that concert again like a month later in Spain at the Mosma Film Music Festival. Um, except that time we did it with like a full Spanish band that was like locals, um, which was a lot of fun. Uh, putting that together was awesome for me zach has like played in a lot of bands before whereas like i this is like i don't know if i like to admit this but like i played in a dave matthews cover band in high school and like that's pretty much my like you know we won battle of the bands at high school that year which was great but uh i i've done a lot of performing but not with like a band you know like a rock band so um so that was just really fun i the it is, uh, I don't know, a little intoxicating to like be on stage, you know, making music for people and having them like respond. Like I get, I get that now in a way I think I didn't quite in, in like a stuffier concert hall setting. Um, but in terms of putting it together, um, that show was a lot of fun and it actually really helped Zach and I kind of like work out some ideas for like, future seasons and like like the way we develop themes and whatnot because like if you look at the soundtrack for uh seasons one and two like uh a lot of the music is like we're like a cue might not be that long because in the show like a sequence is only 30 seconds or you know a minute or a minute and a half and like there's a couple really big montages but there's no time to like really develop huge long pieces of music in tv um and so we took the opportunity to like expand all of our ideas. And some of them were like a little out there. We were like, hey, let's like take that like Miguel Hawk fight from season two and we'll like combine these ideas from like three cues and then like turn it into like a Berkeley core like math metal thing. Like, and it's still the same piece of music, but just kind of like goes down one road or another. And, and it really like, greased the wheels in our brains so that when we sat down to write season three like we had like all this fresh ammunition um so it was a lot of fun it's definitely something we want to do again i actually like one reason i would really like the world to go back to normal is to play another cobra kai live show um so i'm hoping uh you know when when the world does go back to normal uh that can be like our big uh big return party oh i hope so thanks man and I'm glad you were there. That's oh awesome. yeah, yeah. It was All amazing. Right. I hope you do it again. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. Yeah, it's literally so much fun. Okay, great que question, Stephen. Loved hearing that you were in a Dave Matthews band cover band, Leo. That's pretty <laughs> awesome, actually. That's really cool. Um, okay, and then the next question we have is uh, Gabriel. So let me unmute you and then go ahead and ask. Sorry, I didn't realize I had to click a button too. <laughs> um, so Leo, don't feel too bad. We all have dark uh, musical secrets in our past. I was in a Christian punk band, so there you go. I, you, yours is better than mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of building off of uh, Leo's idea of um, you know things getting back to normal. I, I've noticed that like with COVID and being stuck at home, I've been listening to like a lot of really like dark ambient music and like, you know, really drudgy noise stuff because it kind of mirrors like how I'm feeling inside a lot of the time. Uh, are there any like cues like that you're starting to see, you know, develop it in, you know, any of the production stuff that any of you are doing that it is kind of being brought out because people are stuck at home and have just kind of like a different emotional place than they did before all of this. All right, and Gabriel, just to confirm, this is a question for everyone, correct? Yeah, that is for everyone. Awesome. I just wanted to make Leo feel less bad about being in a Dave Matthews cover band. <laughs> <laughs> all good, all good. Um, Andrew, why don't we start with you, yeah? Oh, yeah. Um, so trends that have developed. Um, yes, I mean, we, we've seen a few um, ones that may not maybe speak to the melancholy that has been like a global kind of phenomenon, but more to um, trends that 
we've seen a lot of live action production companies um, approaching us as an animation studio and being like, well, you know, we've got this thing that we've got budget for that we were going to shoot and now we can't shoot it. So let's do some animation. And so we've been doing like a lot of animation um, education, just educating on the process, how long it takes, how much it costs, um, uh, the steps to get your product um, and, and what those are. And, and it's been quite an interesting process. And we've, we've seen a lot of those, a lot of that work converts to animation work, which has been really cool. And we hope, I mean, this is our hope is that, that um, the world is going to see animation as being a good mainstream alternative, not just in storytelling, but in advertising and just pretty much every, you know, avenue of entertainment in its many forms, you know? So we have started seeing that. Um, I, I don't think we're the only ones. Uh, the animation studios that we've been speaking to um, have seen a, a similar trend. Um, and we've spoken to some uh, studios based in the US as well. And, uh, and in terms of storytelling as well, I mean, I just think, you know, we, we've got this, this animated project called Asora and uh, we had been pitching it around. We're actually in, in Miami for, for a while um, at Kids Screen in Miami. And uh, we've been pitching it around and, and uh, you know, there was some interest that had been gauged. But I, I, I tell you, like after COVID, like the, that interest just seemed to escalate. Everybody was like, oh, well, you know, all these live action projects are just put on hold. And the only projects that can continue and the ones that can continue into the foreseeable future is animation. And we just found that a lot more animation projects, ours included, just started gaining traction that potentially we, we might not have seen, you know, um, if it wasn't for, for COVID. So uh, not that I want to put a silver lining on it, but I guess that's maybe necessary in, in, in these times, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's been uh, positive for the animation industry as a whole. Awesome. Let's go to Laura. Uh, may I just have a little bit of, uh, um, and just repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. My questions get really rambly. I apologize. No, 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 no. So like, so like I've noticed that personally, I, I'm listening to like stuff that, you know, kind of changes with my mood and being stuck at home all the time, I'm wondering if see, you're seeing trends in like, you know, costuming or any other production that kind of mirrors other people's like weird emotional place. Cause we're all like in a really weird emotional place right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely feel like when, when COVID, like there was a very hard like production end. So a lot of um, in the spring when a lot of the press, productions just kind of got like paused or abandoned or whatever you feel especially customers felt like uh i mean i think everybody felt like a uh, going back to i think i don't know if it was leo or roman about like when you're not working you feel very odd and so when especially when you're not anticipating it and all of a sudden like you know your stream of income everything is paused it, it definitely is like a shock um more so um when you're you know your show is just done for the season or your project's finished um but i especially know in the costuming community there is um a switch of direction because we didn't know what was happening and so a lot of customers decided to um join this like movement of like mask making and ppe production and that was really interesting to observe at the beginning of covid and that like my union um, Costume Designers Guild 892 here in LA, they um, specifically started a mandate where like they started a volunteering team. They worked with local hospitals to really get headcounts in terms of what they needed and what kind of PPE, seeing other um, like prop fabricators starting to make face shields out of 3D printing and, um, and even camera people starting to do that. So that was really fascinating and um, I think it really speaks to the problem solving nature of a lot of creatives in our world that you know they're just like well we have this knowledge we might as well use it for the greater good and so that was um, that was something that was very helpful in a time that I think a lot of 
a lot of us felt very hopeless and very confused and scared. You know, we're not able to see our loved ones and things like that. So having something besides like video games, which is like one of my favorite go-to decompressing mechanisms, but uh, it was really great to be <laughs> productive at the same time to be able to be like, well, I have the skill, how can I use it to help somebody else? And, you know, range from being able to donate to hospitals or being able to sell it for like five to ten dollars and being like this is a small amount of income that can help me with my groceries because I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so that was really interesting to see and very inspiring to see that people decided to use their creativity in a very powerful way. Um, and so uh, you know and now that has died down a bit but still using creativity in a way to be able to uh, keep your spirits lifted in a time that I think is very um, tumultuous, you know, with everything going on or using their art in a way that is um, serving the community. I think that was really great and very comforting. So that's yeah. cool. Thanks, Laura. Let's go on to Roman. Uh, sure. So Gabriel, I, the last uh, feature I just did was super dark. The music was this ambient uh, mix of hybrid, you know, orchestral and synthesizers. And it, it almost <laughs> sounded like a horror score at times when people heard the score by itself. Um, and the polar opposite has been happening for me. And, and I'm not sure if these are trends or just the projects that I'm happening to find myself in. Uh, but the, the last one that I just got asked to do, it's a, a kid's show. And it's um, it's called Kid Correspondent. It's a YouTube original, and the whole the shift from doing like this uh, hyper violent dark score to doing something that's for kids uh, kind of pointed out to me, uh, you know, what I was seeing on my own, and that I I didn't necessarily want to watch dark shows when this was happening because life was dark enough, and like when stuff's bad, you know, you wanted to. Um, find find some light in the art that you were consuming not just making and then also I guess the trend with it and, and maybe it speaks a little bit to what Andrew was saying was that with animation stuff is getting pushed through and um, in my experience I'm getting asked more to do animation that happens to be for children as opposed to adult animation um, and I think there's something to that that's actually timely which is that people are home with their children um, and so they need uh, media for them, but also to speak to the child and all of us and, and you know, especially when we're scared or we're looking for a ray of hope. Uh, and the music is totally different. You know, I was even surprised I was asked to do the last project I did because I just come off writing really dark music and they wanted, uh, you know, kid friendly, happy music. Um, but it was such a joy, kind of like, you know, how Leo was saying to balance those two projects, you know, have uh, some contrasting projects, it makes you feel whole as an individual and an artist and helps in both of those projects. Um, but yeah, I think there is a shift going on, um, it, even if it's momentary, um, you know, from, from some darkness to some light, uh, I'm an optimist in, in that regard. Uh, so hopefully that trend continues, um, but not that there's no place for the darker emotions that we all feel too. Um, yeah. Thank you, Roman. Let's go to Steve. Sorry, okay, I got prompted for the first time there. Uh, great answers, everybody. Uh, I'll just sort of give you a few anecdotes. Um, you know, in the game industry, things are still happening, right? Like the, the games industry is still doing pretty, you know, there, there's some, uh, there's always gonna be stories of, of companies going out of business or, you know, uh, a certain subset of games not doing so well. But um, for the most part, games have remained you know, untouched by by the, the virus and there's a lot of work going around. My projects are, have, you know, didn't skip a beat, kept going. Uh, one one project that I, I have been working on for a long time is like a fairly emotional, like small chamber group, cello, you know, guitar folksy kind of kind of soundtrack. And uh, the lead designer for the project, I think after COVID like wanted me to go more emotional just like turn that mm. emotional dial up, make it more minor sus to <laughs> swells and just, so I know I definitely noticed a difference that if it difference that when it didn't hit those marks, if it was like too upbeat, uh, he would get upset like <laughs> over chat, of course. You know? I was like, oh, okay. You just want every song to be slow. Like, that's cool. I, I get it. Like, 
I feel yeah, I feel that too. Um, but I, you know, uh, on another note, um, you know, I do a lot of stuff in just like the generative, I, like I've said before, generative AI space. And we're definitely seeing a lot of appetite for interactivity, um, not just watching a concert, but interacting with a concert. There are other companies doing this too. Um, ways for, because fans can't really, you know, there's like all the tours got canceled, right? All, all the, all the big um, uh, festivals got canceled. So like, this is where people are meeting to gather around an artist that they share in. So one of the things I'm working on right now is like trying to build in that interactivity an extra level of because you know really quickly like the zoom concert thing or the twitch concert thing kind of got old pretty fast let's say there's not <laughs> value in that there's a lot i love those I, I was just watching a jazz concert on friday with my wife that was like our date you know uh, <laughs> but but i think i think uh, you know people that generally you know the, the twitch audience or the tiktok audience are are ready right now this is sort of the season where we can really try some experiments on a mass hmm. scale of, of like how what like how people want to engage with their fan with their with their favorite artists or a community around like a target subgenre of music. So um, that that's a lot of what I've been thinking about the last couple of months. Thanks, Steve. Leo. Yo, um, you know, kind of like Roman was saying in an earlier answer. Like, if you're working in music in television, like you're the you're the tail end of the of the process and so in a lot of ways like i don't know if i've seen like a big shift in the in the COVID attitude yet because like i'm finishing like pre-covid stuff mm -hmm. and like i had a lot going on when like the shutdown ha happened and like have kind of been like finishing projects one at a time and now i'm kind of like working on only one and what I've seen, I, I like, I see no different attitude towards that project as it, it continues to on go. However, to what Andrew was saying, like animation is uh, blowing up right now. And so like kind of every new opportunity that I do get like a whiff of or read about, it's all animated. Um, mm -hmm. And even just like anecdotally, um, I, uh, I do a show with the animation company Titmouse called Tigtone on Adult Swim. It's an amazing show. It, like, it's, it's totally bonkers. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, just talking to those guys over at Titmouse, like, I feel like their company has grown. I mean, maybe don't quote me on this because I'm sure I'm going to get it wrong. But, like, it seems like they've, like, grown t into twice the operation since COVID happens. Like, they've got a whole new office that nobody's even going into yet, but it's, like, their – uh, they've, they've got all these shows ordered. They've like, I have like other friends who like didn't, who like now work for Titmouse, like who are just like editors and whatnot. So I think they're like gobbling up just like talent everywhere because they need so many people. Um, well, well, one actually adult animation in particular was really on the upswing even before COVID. It's a like hugely popular genre right now. And, um, and especially for like streaming services like Netflix, I think it's some of their highest performing stuff. Um, and so I think this was like an opportunity to go all in on that. And uh, we, as consumers, like we won't have seen it yet. And even as like creators, if we're on the tail end of the process, like those projects that are getting greenlit during COVID, we're not gonna touch for a while, but you know, in nine months or so, I think you're gonna see a lot of really great uh, animation and adult animation on pretty much every platform. Um, which is cool. Very cool. Thank you so much for your answers, guys. I really appreciate it. Great. And then um, next we have another reporter, Benji, who uh, joined in. And so I'm going to unmute him and have him ask his question next. Hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm Benji from Jamedics. And yeah, I've got a couple questions. Um, and my first one's for Laura. Um, and I was just thinking, I, I was curious about how much like contemporary fashion and contemporary design and designers um, influences your design as opposed to just like more historical and like in, in you know, other genre film and that kind of thing. Oh, thank you for a great question. I love it. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, it all depends on the script really in terms of, um, what the inspiration or the needs are. So if I'm working on a contemporary film, you know, um, it, and it's 
speaks to who the people are. I think that's where I'm constantly drawing the inspiration. So depending if it's period or contemporary, um, you know, the film industry tends to lend towards more contemporary projects than let's say a Kai concept or period film, simply because of money, usually most of the time that mm -hmm. contemporary films are less expensive than a period project because, you know, you, you're usually not doing as many custom builds compared to, um, you know, fully period or sci-fi or fantasy project. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say that there isn't, like one of the most recent films that it, it just released, Synchronic, was an interesting blend of contemporary and period because and sci-fi because it was time travel, but also the contemporary clothes changed because of the time travel. So in that instance, you know, um, even my contemporary designs can be influenced by designers or collections that are from 20 or 30, even farther back, if there are certain design lines that really speak to um, the, like the character or what I want to portray for um, this particular script. So in that case, you know, we had a Anthony, Anthony Mackie was wearing this coat that became more Cronenbergian like as the film went on because it like the time traveled and so I looked at um these collections by these whole couture designers Hussein Shayalan, Shayalan <laughs> he's a Turkish designer and um Iris Van Herpen who did these really incredible designs that worked with using a like draping the fabric to actually look like sound waves moving through the physical space so that was really fascinating to see that and see how um you can really play with silhouette and to make it seem really otherworldly and so that was a, a way that we tried doing it and that was technically a contemporary costume it was a carhartt coat with some uh mm -hmm. what is it regular jeans and so how we decided to manipulate that you know and the ideas come across you know it all kind of depends so um yeah <laughs> awesome thank you no thank you um, and yeah, just, you know, a more, a question for the composers. I was just curious about maybe like some personal favorites of a recent soundtrack release. We can start with Roman. Um, do you, do you mean somebody else's or, or your own soundtrack release? No, no, your own. Yeah. Oh, my own soundtrack release. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so um, I guess I have a new one coming out and it's about two weeks. It's for the um, feature film Orican on HBO. Um, so we were waiting, we just, we got lucky. Um, you know, it's, it's a feature film, like I said, on HBO and HBO Max, and it was um, a Latin X film. Um, but even though it came out here, uh, because of COVID, it had a hard time getting theatrical release, but they secured theatrical release in the UK um, and they were able to pull it off. Uh, you know, they're still trying to be safe with it and everything. Um, but I was mm -hmm. waiting till after the theatrical release for the soundtrack. So that's coming out in about two weeks. Um, and I'm super excited about that one. Um, that's the big soundtrack I'm pushing at the moment. Hell yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Nice. Thank um, you. Uh, we have two more composers uh, here. We have Steve and Leo. So uh, let's go with Steve first. Sure, so um, I'd suppose I'd mention Signs of the Sojourner, which is a uh, card narrative mashup game where um, the actual card game is a conversation between two people. So the cards represent uh, like a phrase or a feeling. Um, and if you guys are, if the two, uh, you know, the two people playing against each other have it's the same set of cards that sort of matches like a language that they're speaking the same language and then they are essentially on the same page and continue talking to each other continue more games uh maybe secrets or or missions will open up it's a super fascinating mechanic um and to get to write music for this type of game uh this was actually pre-covid but it got released right uh right after you know march or april around that time uh, when all this sort of started um, so it hit when it hit, it, I think it really struck a nerve with people about like connecting and social distancing being actually physical distancing, mm. it's still socially sort of, you know, talk to each other some one way or another. I think, I think that, uh, I, I felt like the community really, uh, saw the, the interesting nugget of what this game mechanic could do and the conversation behind it. 
Um, but musically, I, I really enjoyed writing for it. It's like got all my favorite uh, inspirations in there. Jazz, like Chicago jazz from the, the late or the early aughts and uh, indie rock and like African influenced kind of music. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a mashup of things because the cultures that, that, that you find within this game are kind of all over the place, a little alien, um, a little Android and digital. It, it's, it's, you know, uh, just like the game in and of itself is a mashup, the cultures that you find are kind of all over the place. So uh, it, it was a, in a way that, in that way, it was kind of a dream project where I felt like I was able to write music that I would have wanted to make anyway, you know, for my band or something. Um, so yeah, uh, check it. I think that they're they're planning on a switch port, which should be out later this year. I actually don't know the date, but sometime soon. Hell yeah, that sounds very cool. Thank you. And then one more composer, Leo. Um, just muted you. Yo, yo. Um, you know, it's funny when you work in uh, TV and film, you are not usually in control of your own soundtrack releases. So uh, you have to get approval from God knows who in a lot of cases <laughs> um, to actually like get the damn thing on Spotify. Um, but I've, I've had some good luck lately. I've actually taken a chunk of this like quarantine time to go through some old projects like documentaries and uh, a couple indie movies I did where, where I have kind of all the control to release them and I've been getting them ready and mastered to do a release. Um, but of, of some stuff that's like currently on, we just did uh, that project, the Titmouse thing I mentioned before, Tigtone. Mm -hmm. uh, we just did a uh, two album, uh soundtrack release for that for one for each season um it's like crazy fantasy music you know the show is a lot of fantasy tropes and like dungeons and dragons tropes um and so you know it's it's uh kind of lord of the ringsy but just kind of crazy and all over the place it was a lot of fun to write so i'm really happy to like have a soundtrack release for it um and then uh, in the Cobra Kai universe, actually, um, there is a Cobra Kai video game that comes out tomorrow. And uh, mm. Zach and I actually wrote the music for it, kind of as guest artists almost, <laughs> in, in a way. Um, and use the opportunity to like really go all in on, on some uh, sort of peripheral Cobra Kai sounds. Um, the album also comes out tomorrow. It is a lot of fun. Um, it really borrows from some like, the, the game itself borrows from like old school, like beat em up side scrollers, um, Double Dragon. And uh, so, we, so we leaned heavily in that. Uh, we always think of like, they're, they're, man, there's like a great Power Rangers side scroller I used to play all the time. And like, definitely some influence of the music from that in, in this game. It is a lot of fun. And uh, then also in that sound world, uh, season three of Cobra Kai comes out on Netflix on January 8th. And we just finished all of our edits for the season three album uh, and are sending it off to mastering this week. So stay tuned for that because it's got a lot of bangers on it. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I'm definitely going to check that out. And yeah, no, thank you. And yeah, no, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Benji. And it looks like we just have one more question to wrap everything up from Andy. Um, so let me go ahead and unmute you. Hello. Um, yeah, so I just had a really quick question um, for the composers as well. Um, so we were talking a bit about sort of shifting between tones of projects and i was curious when i guess i guess if you have a specific approach to how you're gonna how you're gonna build um the sound for like a drama versus a comedy like if there's maybe like specific instruments or sounds that you sort of immediately go to based on the genre all right let's go with roman uh thanks andy so um for me it's that's usually actually the first conversation that i have with whoever i'm answering to uh <laughs> so most of the time it's the director sometimes it's the producer or the showrunner or the creator um really kind of depends 
Um, sometimes they have reference music and um, sometimes they're a little more married to that reference music than other times. <laughs> uh, and that kind of dictates a lot of the work that I'll be doing. Um, but I've been lucky that on the last two or three projects that I've worked on, even though the deadlines were really tight, um, I had worked with the directors before. So there was a, a pretty good amount of trust there already. Um, so we started the project by um, doing some cue collections, you know, uh, them explaining what they were going for with the narrative, the emotional palette. Um, and then I came up with some musical concepts that I thought represented um, what they were doing. Um, and then I, I got the yeses and the noes, the strong yeses, the strong noes to all the stuff that I was doing. Um, you know, you're trying to elicit uh, like that strong response from them. So you know what instruments they're not liking, what, uh, you know, both the content and the instrumentation that they're responding to. Um, and, but again, that's not in the case where there's not temp music going on. O otherwise, it's, uh, in my experience, a, a little, uh, you know, you have a little more freedom in, in those cases. And again, it also depends on the deadlines. Um, but people come to you often for things you've done in the past. So um, sometimes they kind of want you to do the same sounds that you've done. Uh, and Sometimes they don't. So, you know, it's it's different for each project, but generally it's it's very much the first conversation you're having, either musically or in English uh, with um, yeah. a director. Yeah. Let's go to Steve. Sure. So um, I think that that's kind of a tough question to ask because Roman, you, you hit you hit that on there pretty well, where it's like, it's less so maybe the, the genre and more so the environment or the or the like location, so mm -hmm. maybe the characters and their backgrounds, um, less so than um, the genre in my experience. Uh, that being said, if you're doing a western, you better use you know a telly with a ton of reverb and tremolo, or else you're in the wrong business. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but like you know, in another example is like I did I did this show um, Three Busy Debras for Adult Swim. Mm -hmm. It was one of my first experiences where there intentionally was not a sound of like the ensemble or, you know, a, a template that I would pull from because it was, they wanted every moment to moment joke essentially to be treated as its own, you know, sonic, oh, interesting. Uh, you know, um, yeah, like, like almost as, as if it was temp, but not, you know, as it was scored yeah uh, so, so it went back and forth between tons of different styles like like what it could be like epic orchestra orchestra horror you know folk going into you know sweet overly romantic uh you know smooth jazz or something you know because it was t it was with the jokes so like, mm -hmm. depending on where it needed to land uh, whether or not it needed to be mickey mouse or like a full score two minute thing um and then, you know, but, but the, my, my favorite projects and this bringing it back to games are the ones where, you know, the, the, like, like Roman, like you were saying, where the, the design team might know some of your early work because, and you know, they, they maybe have played a game where, you know, you're, you scored something that you, that really resembles music that you want to write. So whether or not it's a comedy or a drama, they just want you to be you and score your sound to, to their project, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, another reason I love games is that the, it's a small enough world where people know it's like, oh, you're the chip tune person, you're yeah. like the the chamber orchestra, uh, you know, um, like, you know, uh, gonna gonna work with the LA Phil, yeah, know, or or LA LCO rather, and then or like you're the the person who did Metroid. Well, I want you to do my mm -hmm. Metroid knockoff or something. Yeah, <laughs> after that happens often, you know. Um, so yeah, thanks. Awesome. And let's end it all with Leo. Um, hey, uh, you know, I, uh, I've done like a string of projects recently where I'm sort of like inheriting like a, like an IP that somebody else started, um, which is, is sort of interesting when it comes to like what the music should sound like, because there's, there's, like a sound and a template there. Like a, a really good example would be, I do that show, uh, Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, everyone on the planet knows what Jurassic Park sounds like. Um, but like, I'm not just supposed to like rehash that. And like the worst thing in the world would be for it to just kind of sound like budget John Williams and like yeah. not, not really be the, I don't know, just like wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want that to go out into the world. So um, the, uh, I, I guess like for like in answering like that project specifically, like, I know the palette is going to be orchestra and it's going to be kind of like a mix of um, like 20th century horror stuff and sort of maybe more like what, what the uh, regular household John Williams, like cinematic uh, thematic vibe would be. But then it's, it's really just like up to me to do that my own way. So it like shares the same DNA, but it's not, not the same, uh, I don't know, exact same thing. And uh, yeah. another example of this, like inheriting an IP would be like Cobra Kai. Um, you know, the Karate Kid has a fantastic Bill Conti score that uses a lot of pan flutes and like I play pan flutes. So like, that's like a fun little nod. But actually when we were making the palette for that, um, starting at square one, we really started kind of with, it was like, okay, we know we're going to, there's going to be this orchestra element that is Conti uh, in or inspired, I would say, maybe. Although actually, I think ultimately the orchestra stuff doesn't sound a lot like Conti. But um, the the backbone of the score is actually kind of like a score palette that we invented out of all of the songs from the original Karate Kid soundtrack. Because like I think when people think of the music from that movie, they don't even think of Bill Conti. They're thinking of like You're mm -hmm. the Best Around and Young Hearts and like all the um, all those pop songs that like really provide the beat and backbone. And so for us, like that is like kind of the core of Cobra Kai and like, it, you know, the, then you like flesh it out with sort of the, the orchestra around it. So I guess it's kind of like, it applies to original projects too. And, and it bounces off of some things that have already been said, but like those, those palette conversations are the earliest ones you have. And sometimes you kind of get the opportunity if it's like a totally original to just kind of go in your hole and pitch your idea. And then that in a lot of ways can become your like house band, so to speak. And so your like home base is whatever that sound is that you've kind of like, uh, I don't know, been inspired by. And then it's just a matter of getting bigger or smaller, you know, in terms of what, what you're including in that sound um, as the show goes on.